Yu-Gi-Oh! is one of my favorite series of all time. When I was younger, I used to get home from school, I used to toss on the Yu-Gi-Oh!, you know, summon the Dark Magician, all of that. I've watched the original series, GX, I watched 5Ds, which is better than you expect, actually. I saw a lot of people dunking on 5Ds, it's really good, but I've never seen past that. I did try and get into V-Rains, but I, I couldn't, or V-Rains, whatever it's called. So now we're gonna completely catch up. We're gonna learn everything there is to know about the Yu-Gi-Oh! anime and manga timeline. I'm gonna absorb all of the lore possible. Let's dive into it. The Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline is a bit of a mess. There are currently eight anime shows and, coincidentally, eight manga projects. The original Duel Monsters anime was adapted from the Duel Monsters manga, but none of the other series are adaptations. And the first Wait, really? series of the anime all seem to take place in the same universe, but everything after that seems pretty self-contained, sorta. So okay. before I start to make heads or tails of this, anime and the manga for GX are separate, they're not adaptations? So is is Jaden still in it? Okay, I feel like I'm gonna learn so much. I know nothing about the manga. I know the original manga was like really weird, they had different games, there was death in it and things like that. So there's a lot of undiscovered things we're gonna find out I today. I know that some of you are already running to the comment section to say that there is no overarching, interconnected Yu-Gi-Oh! continuity. That That's the show you. is just a series of 30-minute card commercials, and that I am wasting my time by talking that, about this. That's what you sound and like. If you're doing that, I have yep. just one thing to say to you. Yep. What's that? That's boring. You're boring, everybody! Quit boring, everyone! Okay, That's so we're gonna start with the first five anime shows. Yu-Gi-Oh's Duel Monsters, GX, 5Ds, Zexel, and Arc 5. And for the purposes of this theory, all of these shows take place one after the other in one mostly unbroken timeline. Okay, I know I know the original Yu-Gi-Oh is kind of like in modern day when it came out. I know GX is, I don't know how much after, but it's it's not too much after. They open an academy, so it can't be, it must be like, what, 10 years, 20 years after maybe. 5Ds is like way into the future. And then Zexel and Arc 5, I haven't even touched. So this is all tread in new grounds. Duel Monsters happens, then GX, then 5Ds, then Zexel, then Arc 5. In Duel Monsters, we learn that the world used to be full of dark magics, and that sorcerers in ancient Egypt used this magic to play the shadow games, rituals that allowed them to bind and control the spirits of monsters. Man, those games must have sucked. They get one card, it's on this massive piece of rock, so they have to spend like 25 years chiseling their card. They're like, oh man, this card's gonna be so good. You finally get into play a game, you spent 25 years making your one card, and it immediately crumbles to dust because you're facing off with a blue eyes white dragon. The Shadow Games brought the world to the brink of destruction, until an ancient pharaoh was forced to seal away the games to protect mankind from the threat that they represented. Yeah, we should do the same for like EA and Ubisoft games now. Too many microtransactions, you need to seal them away, they're too threatening. Millennia passed, and an archaeologist named Maximilian Pegasus discovered the historic remains of the Shadow Games while in a dig in Egypt. He was granted the Millennium Eye by the spirit guardian Shadi, and used it in order to produce and mass market the Shadow Games as the modern game of duel monsters. This led to a renewed interest in Egyptian archaeology, which sent Solomon Moto searching through old tombs and crypts, until Solomon discovered the Millennium Puzzle, which he then gave to his grandson. He discovered the Millennium Puzzle in an ancient crypt and thought, Ah, I don't know, this puzzle's kind of difficult. I'll give it to a ten-year-old instead. He'll probably figure it out. Upon solving the puzzle, Yugi unlocked the spirit must have been easy. ancient Egyptian pharaoh sealed within, and found that this spirit would come to his aid in times of great difficulty, and was particularly adept at helping him play the game of Duel Monster. In times of great difficulty? What if he was doing an exam in, in maths or something like that? He's sitting there like, oh, Pharaoh, I don't know. What is the square root of 52? He's like, don't worry, Yugi. Yugi, oh! All of a sudden, there's like a 25-year-old man sitting in the test center like, I know exactly what the answer is, Yugi. I'll take this care of this for you. Yugi meets the Duel Monsters national champion, Seto Kaiba, who kidnaps Solomon in order to steal his incredibly rare Blue Eyes White Dragon card, which he proceeds to shred before their very eyes. That's Yugi crazy. You think he'd keep the Blue Eyes as like a backup? Like, what, what if he drops one of them? What if one falls in like a sink? I know people are usually careful about their prized possessions, but they don't have sleeves on them when they're playing their cards. They ain't got sleeves on them. Looks like they're easily terrible, right? So something could befall the cards. Might as well keep it back up. Challenges Kaiba to a revenge duel, which the spirit of the Millennium Puzzle helps him win by being the first player to ever successfully summon Exodia, the Forbidden One. This win attracts the attention of Maximilian Pegasus, who uses his Millennium Eye to imprison Solomon's soul away within a playing card, and coerces Yugi into competing in his upcoming Duelist Kingdom tournament. For corporate reasons, 
and to see his dead girlfriend again, but mostly corporate reasons. Yugi and the Pharaoh proceed to win Pegasus's competition, saving all of his victims and establishing Yugi as something of an international celebrity. Immediately following the end of the tournament, Kaiba returns home only to find out that his company has been taken over by five members of its executive board, who proceed to trap him inside of a virtual reality simulation that Yugi and company have to rescue him from. That's the most normal corporate takeover of all time. Least hostile takeover. His brother Mokubo was there. It was weird. Believe it or not, this is gonna be important. Oh yeah, Mokubo was also like a princess. <laughs> Kaiba, Yugi and the Pharaoh go on to compete in the Battle City tournament, where the Pharaoh learns about his past as the ruler of Egypt and that his powers are tethered to the spirits of the three Egyptian god monsters. All right, let's be honest. The Battle City Tournament, one of the best arcs in anime history. Let's be honest right now. The competition becomes a free-for-all power grab as various factions attempt to use it as a front to collect all of the god cards and the powers of the Pharaoh for themselves. But when the dust settles, Yugi is left holding all three god cards and four of the Millennium items. Oh, and there was this whole thing with Kaiba's other brother. That's sort of going to be important too. That was a the bad arc. I'm sorry. While well, the gang does a side quest in Atlantis, darts in the Seal of Ori Kalkos, the legend- I like the Seal of Ori Kalkos arc. It was pretty cool because you get to see the Seal of Ori Kalkos, and that's kind of cool. The, the Dwaken the Dragons thing was kind of cool too. The last tournament kind of falls off completely. I think Battle City and Duelist Kingdom is exactly what Yu-Gi-Oh is known for, and people mostly forget about the other arcs. Ori Dragons, that stuff all happens, it all counts. The Kaiba Corp Grand Prix, yeah, that- I rewatched this recently and I was like, oh, this does not hold up. Technically counts. And then the show wraps up with the Pharaoh and the Spirit of the Millennium Ring playing a shadow game in the memory world that ends with everything being fine. The planet does not get destroyed, the good guys win, and after one last duel, Yugi and the Pharaoh finally part ways, with the Pharaoh departing for the land of the dead. Man, that was sad. Yugi prepares to move on to adulthood. Oh man, that was a sad ending, that. That episode where he just leaves, it's like, oh dude, he earned it, Yugi wins. Man, such a good ending for what's his attempt. <laughs> That's point one on our timeline, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters. Done. Next, we have Yu-Gi-Oh! GX, which takes place 10 years later when Yugi bumps into a kid named Jaden Yuki, who is late for his entrance examination at Kaiba's fancy duel school. Our old heroes just kinda got a feeling about this kid, and so he hands over his winged Karibo card and wishes Jaden luck. Jaden proceeds to win an examination duel that's been rigged against him in order to get into Duel Academy. Man, I love GX so much. It is so unnecessarily dunked on. It's just goofy fun. Like, it, you, the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series is kind of serious, like kind of serious shonen kind of stuff, where it's like, oh, the end of the world and stuff like that. This is just, we need to go to a school and we're gonna hang out with our buds. And then we're gonna duel the school bully and own him. And then we're gonna send him to Antarctica, what? I love GX. Also, the GX opening, almost as good as the original series opening. The, the game on, get your game on, is so good. Yeah, crowd is creepy. And he ends up in the Slifer dorm, which is where students with the lowest grades and records are placed, but he still ends up being the best in his year anyways. In his first year, he stops a gang of duelists from getting their hands on the Sacred Beast cards, which could have potentially led to the end of the world. In his second year, he stops- Oh, I forgot it could potentially lead to the end of the world. That is true. But also the Sacred Beast cards, are kind of cool. I know they're just reskins of the god cards. They're like B-Tech god cards, Walmart god cards, but still, they're, they're pretty cool. Like, the, the designs are nice. The fortune teller who is possessed by a psychic light from using a satellite to brainwash the entire planet. Don't ask, it doesn't make any more sense in context. Then in his third year, he meets a cute boy, goes dimension hopping with him, runs into his ex-girl card, watches all of his friends die, becomes a mass murderer, self-actualizes, patches things up with his ex, and goes on to save the world from the devil before having a for funsies duel in the past with Yugi. Okay, I just realized I have not seen that season. <laughs> Oh man, wow. Have I only seen season one and two? Oh God, I, I, didn't, I don't remember that one. <laughs> a bunch of other characters and locations from Duel Monsters show up. Kaiba actually owns the Duel Academy where Jaden and his friends go to school. And there's also this blink and you'll miss it throwaway reference to Yugi's old high school bully, Tetsu Trudge, in the show's last season. Pretty easy to place this show in the timeline just after- Oh, it wasn't dubbed, that's why. Why was it not in the dub? Dual monsters. Then comes Yu-Gi-Oh 5Ds and the story Underrated. of Yusei Fudo. It's pretty clear from the get-go that this is the same Yu-Gi-Oh we've always known, but different. We're a little ways in the future, and our protagonist is an orphan who grew up in the satellite, a junk town that is all that remains of Domino City, the primary setting of Yu-Gi-Oh Dual Monsters, and a reoccurring setting in Yu-Gi-Oh GX. The upper class of society lives in New Domino City, where event duels are held in a state-of-the-art arena called the Kaiba Dome, 
again a reference to Yugi Moto's original rival. We also learn that Kaiba's company, the Kaiba Corporation, was responsible for reconstruction efforts after Domino was destroyed. That is insane. How powerful is the Kaiba Corporation when they deal in children's card games? I mean, they deal in other stuff too, like he probably sells arms to, I don't know, he probably does like military weapons contracting and things like that. Like he, he makes missiles, I would imagine. But man, Kaiba's Corporation, huge. And they eventually developed dual runner technology for the sport of turbo dueling. Oh, and Yugi's old high school bully Trudge, he shows up again here too. Now he's a thuggish beat cop who starts off working for the bad guys. Oh wait, so it's not that far in the future then. That is really weird that we'd have such a society not that far in the future. It seems like it's like a hundred years or like 50 years into the future. There's no reason for the city to be that far advanced. How many weapons did Kaiba sell? How many missiles did he use to bomb poor countries? Who knows? He learns that friendship is the true meaning of card games on motorcycles. 5Ds definitely feels like the same world as Duel Monsters and GX. It's just aged up a little bit. The franchise has finished going through puberty and now it's ready to save the world with a driver's license. But here's where things start to get weird. 5Ds is a time travel show and most of the events we see actually take place in an altered version of history. We eventually learn that in the original version of Time, Kaiba Corp developed a technology called Momentum, or NRD in the dub, a sort of nuclear power plant that runs on the newly developed synchro summoning mechanic in the Duel Monsters card game. They, <laughs> so silly. They invented time travel because they have a new form of energy that was created via synchro summoning, which is a mechanic in a children's card game. And this new synchro technology led to a golden age of prosperity on Earth. And everybody just played Yu-Gi-Oh all day while riding on their motorcycles, and everything was just perfect. Let's go! But Humanity didn't realize that using synchro monsters to run their power plants was affecting the evolution of the species. Momentum reactors were basically releasing dual monsters radiation across the planet, and people spent 200 years mutating because of it, becoming okay. more cruel, selfish, and destructive. Why does mutation never do cool things? Oh, wait, no, it does in like Marvel shows where you become like Spider-Man and stuff like that. Why, why, does, why can't radiation in the real world like do good things and not just melt your skin off your face? Why is it always bad things that happen when you overdose on things? Why can't that be like a cool reaction? To t oh, you took too many drugs? You can levitate now. What, what if that? Oh, that's kind of like, like Bioshock actually, yeah. That's why Bioshock's the greatest game of all time. They kept pushing momentum technology further and further without realizing that Moment, the operating system running all the momentum tech on the planet, had become self-aware, which led to uh -oh. a classic man versus machine apocalyptic war called the Mechlord Genocides, which ended when all the momentum reactors on the planet exploded, wiping out both sides and leaving the war without a winner. Oh my God, that's terrible. I don't even remember that part. Well, it's been a while since I've watched five Ds to be fair. I think I watched like five years ago. And I was like, wow, this is actually a lot of fun. Like they have these Norse God cards and stuff like that. I totally forgot the lore. However, there were four human survivors, Zone, Antinomy, Aporia, and Paradox. And these four scientists searched for a way to bring back humanity by changing the past, salvaging any functional human or mech lord technology that they could find in order to build a working time machine. And eventually they succeeded and journeyed back in time. Okay, well actually, no. Technically, they all got old and died, but their consciousnesses were uploaded into android duplicates of themselves, and the androids are completely capable of feeling emotion and remembering the pain of mankind's end, so the androids went back in time, which feels like an unnecessary complication in the story, but whatever. No, it's it's to add the cool factor. Like, they're like, oh yeah, the old guys, so we can make the old guys go back in time. But what if the old guys were too late and they all died, but they're androids now? Like, that's, that's what happened in the writer's room. And to be fair, it sounds pretty cool. Like, ooh, there's androids, that's kind of cool. In any event, that's the end of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline. Oh. Duel Monsters, and then GX, and then the Kaiba Corp oh, that's sad. momentum technology into the world. 200 years later, Moment becomes self-aware, there's a global man versus machine war, the reactors go kabloom, everybody dies, and four robots go back in time to try to fix it. See, this is why capitalism bad. This is why <laughs> Kaiba Corp capitalism bad. That is the complete first Yu-Gi-Oh timeline. Damn, that's sad. It's a very sad story. But fortunately for everybody, this timeline gets completely overwritten. It doesn't exist anymore. 
after Woo! abandoning the year 2200 and something, the Zone, Antinomy, Paradox, and Aporia androids proceed to spend centuries rewriting history in various failed attempts at preventing the Mechlord genocides from ever happening. They oh, what did they do? a secret society known as Iliaster in order to reshape history over the course of millennia. Oh my god, they made the Illuminati. Oh, maybe it's right. They made a secret society that is in the background shaping the decisions made by governments and important people. Uh, they literally made the Illuminati. Route 5 Ds, we see Iliaster change history several times. But what did he do? Each time that they do, the present is rewritten to reflect its new past. When Paradox goes back in time to kill Dual Monsters creator Maximilian Pegasus, what? we watch Yusei's period in history begin to collapse as its relative past is altered. No Yusei more guard games? Has to follow Paradox back in time and save Pegasus in order to prevent his world from being erased. They just watched too much of the Terminator, didn't they? They were like, whoa, we should, what if we did the Terminator, but it was Yu-Gi-Oh! This is important because the next show in the series, Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel, or Zale if you prefer the original pronunciation, is where things start to get fuzzy. The story of Zexel follows Yuma Tsukumo as he bonds with an alien spirit creature named Astral, who is suffering from some card game related amnesia. The series focuses on the pair as they search for Astral's lost memories and later find themselves caught up in a war between Astral's homeworld and the invaders from Barian world. Unlike all the previous shows, Zexel doesn't go out of its way to- Wait, and to the fight this war, they play card- Of course they play card games. I just think it's so funny that everything is card games. It's so awesome. Draw a line back to its predecessors. There are no characters from Duel Monsters, GX, or 5Ds around. There are no subtle name drops or familiar locations, and all the new mechanics introduced in 5Ds, like synchro summoning and turbo dueling, are just gone. But there is suddenly this new mechanic called Exceed Summoning, which works yeah, kind of like synchro summoning, but you know, different. It always confuse me why it's called XC summoning when it's XYZs. I'm like, it doesn't, I mean, I guess you could kind of get a pronunciation from that, but it's a, a little weird. Plus, the show kind of feels like a soft reboot of Duel Monsters, with Yuma and Astral's relationship and final duel with one another closely mirroring the story of Yugi and the Pharaoh. Maybe? They tried to be him, but they can never be him. This is the beginning of its own separate universe, but I genuinely don't think so. 5Ds went out of its way to establish that Yu-Gi-Oh's story existed on a single, rewritable timeline, so it would be weird for the next entry in the franchise to throw that out right away. And there sure. are a lot of subtle clues connecting Zexel back to the original trilogy of Yu-Gi-Oh! shows. For example, the Fudo family from 5Ds promised us that momentum technology would lead to a venerable utopia for all of mankind, which is exactly what Heartland City seems to be. Pollution, it's pretty good. Poverty are nowhere to be seen. Automated systems take care of day-to-day -day affairs like sanitation and security. Everybody seems to have ready access to all of the world's futuristic technology. This is the world that Yusei and his father dreamed of creating for mankind. And while the show never discusses the origins of Xyz summoning, there is some interesting lore from the real-world trading card game that fills in the gaps. The 2011 starter deck, Dawn of the Xyz, states that Xyz monsters are made from antimatter and arrived what? in this universe through a black hole. Huh? Which is an odd coincidence, since Yusei happens to witness the- What? They they have antimatter? They're like, oh, what can we do with this antimatter? Why don't we make some cool cards? <laughs> new black hole in the last few episodes of 5Ds and ends the series in possession of the device that Antinomy used to travel to that black hole. Plus, in Zexel, Heartland uses black holes as part of their sanitation department. What? Trash into space rather than letting it pile up on Earth. Oh my God, imagine having a point of civilization where you create tiny black holes just so that you can shit in it. Throw in all the dual monsters and GX era monsters and symbols that show up in the dual lodge during Zexel's first season. And I think we've gone way past coincidence. There are just too many clues tethering this show back to the original three to ignore. Sure, enough time has passed that people aren't commonly discussing the events of the three previous shows. Yeah, I think it's just too far into the future. It would be like hundreds. This would take hundreds of years to build, in theory. I mean, it's anime land, so it can take however long it really needs to take. But this looks like it would take hundreds of years to create this. So it's probably just too far in the future where those people are just like a thing of the past. It would be like us referencing random people from like the 1500s on a regular basis. It's like, yeah, you kind of know of them, but people aren't going to run around and be like, oh my God, Francois, King of France, uh, did this on a normal basis when you're trying to play card games and you're from eight. So yeah, you're not going to do that. But their histories are very much ingrained into the world of Zexel. 
And personally, I think that the show is so much more interesting if you look at it in the context of its predecessors. For example, near the end of Zexel, we learn that the universe was created when a divine dragon willed it and all of life into existence. Wait, what? a divine dragon willed things into existence? Is this Dragon Ball? Is that Shenron? But that the effort of creating reality ultimately caused that dragon's body to die and its soul to crash land on Earth, flooding the planet wow. with energy known as chaos, a power that has mostly disappeared by the time Zexel starts. So, so God is dead then. But where did it go? Why did it disappear? Well, looking at it in the context of dual monsters, I see that <laughs> Chaos is the power that the Pharaoh sealed away when he banished the Shadow Games from our world. Egyptian sorcerers were harnessing their chaos to bind monster spirits to their will, and okay. brought about the end of the world, which sure. is why the Pharaoh was ultimately forced to seal that power away. Sure, you could still use existing chaos items, like the Millennium items or the Shadow Charms, in order to initiate Shadow Games. Oh, okay, so we're saying that the Millennium items are actually just pieces of God, and that's why they have special powers. Okay, I mean, I can get behind that. But ordinary people lost the ability to just do magic once chaos was sealed away. Flash Damn it. a few thousand years, and 5Ds ends with Yusei and the Signers preventing the end of the world, and with Yusei taking over the development of Project Moment for New Domino City. The show always framed synchro summoning and momentum reactors as an allegory for real-world nuclear energy, which currently holds the distinction of having the highest capacity factor of any non-theoretical energy source. But by the time of Zexel, the nuclear metaphor has been replaced by antimatter, which currently holds the distinction of having the highest capacity factor of any theoretical energy source. Okay. that nuclear synchro energy was phased out for safer and more efficient antimatter XCs reactors. Having antimatter be more safe and efficient is kind of hilarious. The, the only thing I know about antimatter is that it just destroys matter, which I don't think it does. I, I'm not a scientist. I'm a dumb idiot. I'm the big, I'm big, dumb, stupid. But whenever I think about antimatter, it's like, oh, it's the thing that just destroys everything. And Zexel doesn't just tie a line back to the original three Yu-Gi-Oh shows. It also sets up some pretty important plot points that future shows will tackle later. In Zexel, Yuma gets caught up in the renewed war between Astral World and Baryon World. Both sides race to get a hold of the Numeron Code, a dual monsters card containing the infinite power of the creator dragon. What? And the series ends with the character Astral using the Numeron Code to reunite Astral World and Baryon World. An okay. action that we're warned has allowed the power of chaos to return to Earth, and which will oh. have grave consequences. A lot of fans have criticized the show for failing to explain what those consequences were, but I actually think we did get our answers in the very next show, Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5. Again, I have no idea what is going on in Arc 5. Zexel and Arc 5, I completely dropped off Yu-Gi-Oh! I still play the old games, I still play like Duel Links, I would still play some of the old games, like I would go back every now and then and play Duelist of the Roses because that's an absolutely go game, I love that. And I played so many Yu-Gi-Oh! games when I was a kid, but this part, I kind of fell off Pokemon at this part as well. This is when I was like in high school, and it was, you know, you saw you do other things. You're playing Call of Duty and Halo instead. That's what I was spending my time doing. Throughout this series, the main characters are constantly jumping back and forth between dimensions that correspond to the different summoning methods in the game. So there's a standard dimension, a fusion dimension, a synchro dimension, and what? an Xyz dimension. Oh, so they're saying that the Xyz dimension is actually separate to the synchro dimension, but in this timeline, we're saying that it's from the same dimension. So how are we going to explain that one away? Also, why is there a different fusion dimension and a normal summoning dimension? That just makes things overly complicated. This was the first multiverse before Doctor Strange could even set his foot in it. And each one resembles the show and the time period in which that summoning method was mainly used. So there oh. are a lot of familiar characters like Alexis Rhodes and Aster Phoenix in the fusion dimension. And most really? of them tie back to Duel Academy. Special cards and plot points from GX show up again here after years of being absent from the anime. And then the Synchro and Xyz dimensions resemble 5Ds and Zexel in the same way. But then at the end of arc five, we learned that all of the different dimensions used to be a single unified dimension. Oh, they got split, okay. I wanna say fusion is definitely my favorite type of uh, like mechanic that they use in terms of like synchro, XYZ, pendulum, the new one, link summoning. Yeah, fusions are just cool. I've always loved the idea of fusions in Dragon Ball, Pokemon, in Yu-Gi-Oh. I just think fusing things together to create new creatures is a really cool idea. That is when it all made sense. The original dimension that we see in flashbacks in Arc 5 is the continuity of all the shows prior to Arc 5. Dual Monsters, GX, 5Ds, and Zexel all happened in the original dimension. Everything from the Numeron Dragon creating the- Oh my god, that is 
Come on, man. You can't convince me that's not Golden Shenron. He has the horns as well. I understand that the horns and the entire design are probably based off of the same original inspiration. But man, they look so similar. Come on. ...to Astral using the Numeron code and inadvertently allowing Chaos Energy to return to mankind. That all happened in one timeline. But what happened next? Well, at the end of Arc 5, we learn about a duelist. A duelist who had no magical items or special technology, who fused with the spirit of his four ace monsters and threatened to destroy the world. Why? A duelist named Zark. Zark. Zark is the consequence of Astral using the Numeron code at the end of Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel. By oh, unsealing the okay. power locked away by the Pharaoh, Astral set the stage for the end of the world. In the end, the Good battle job, Zark grew so intense that reality itself split apart, causing it to reform as the four different dimensions. And okay. this is the first and only point where the Yu-Gi-Oh! timeline actually splits. But it doesn't branch oh, off no, no separate timelines. Of time travel story. This is Yu-Gi-Oh! Of course it's much weirder than that. It actually splits into pieces, and each piece keeps on growing, creating four new timelines, all set during different periods in history, but all happening at the same time. Well, that's why weird. Did history just happened the same way that it did last time. Why was the fusion dimension so different from what we saw in GX? And the same goes for the other three. Well, there are three big reasons. The first is that there seem to be some characters noticeably absent from their respective time periods. Where are Yugi, Jaden, Yusei, and Yuma in the new dimensions? They ran out of plot armor. At the end of the series, they're officially not allowed to have plot armor anymore, so they got like hit by a car or a bird gouged their eyes out by accident, or they had a heart attack on the way down the stairs, or they tripped. Uh, there's a lot of ways these guys can go with that plot armor. These were major players in history, and they're all just gone. Secondly, on the day that the new dimensions were created, two new babies were born in each one that had not existed in the original timeline. Yuya Sakaki and Zuzu Boyle were born in the standard dimension, Yuri and Selina in the fusion dimension, Yugo and Rin in Synchro, and Yuto and Lulu in the Xyz dimension. That is so many characters. These two boys were reincarnations of Zark, with each child possessing a fraction of his soul, while the girls were reincarnations of Rei, the duelist who finally defeated Zark before reality split. See, I keep telling you, that's why all men are trash. <laughs> this is why men are evil. And of course, the third and most obvious reason that the dimensions ended up being different is that Arc 5 antagonist Leo Akaba derailed history when he started jumping between dimensions and starting wars. For all intents and purposes, Leo Akaba is a time travel from the future, who jumped back and forth between the different dimensions and their different periods in history, bringing new technology with him. Where the standard dimension started out with nothing but the original Kaiba Corp era dual discs, Leo Akaba used his knowledge of the future in order to create his solid vision dual discs. This pollution of history caused things to play out in a fundamentally different way, where the fusion, synchro, and Xyz dimensions are fundamentally unrecognizable from their original versions of history. The plot of Arc 5 sees Zark reunite all the lost pieces of his spirit in order to uh -oh. resurrect himself, only to be thwarted by the heroes from all four dimensions and his old foe, Rey. This jumbles up reality again, causing the standard dimension to be recreated as the pendulum dimension. And the pens- oh no! <laughs> Not the pendulum dimension! Nah, it's a dead joke at this point. I understand everyone dunks on pendulums, but like, they're a little goofy. Zark's essence is trapped and later purified in a baby. It's a little weird. And that- That makes sense. Coolest. If you send someone back to being a baby, then they don't have the original evilness. They don't have the original personality disorders or whatever it is that make them do the things they do in the first place. As a baby is untouched. A baby is the ideal icon of purity and innocence. A baby does not have hate. A baby has only a blank slate. This is the complete Yu-Gi-Oh! anime timeline. A magic dragon created the universe and cried itself to death. Its tears gave magic to the earth. People spent a few thousand years playing cards with one another until time exploded. Oh, okay. One guy started an interdimensional war and blew time up again, which was ultimately fine because an evil baby smiled. Nice. A beautiful, wonderful series. And it all makes Anyone sense. Who says otherwise is yep. wrong. Yeah, and there is no other shows after Arc 5. Uh, there is definitely not a show called Reigns. And that's it. That's the end of the timeline. And there is definitely not 16 minutes left on this video. So we can all call. Okay, let's keep going. And as ridiculous as that description was, I feel like these clues fit together well enough that this may have actually been intentional on someone's part on the writing team. 
We'll never know. Konami has long since made it clear that they don't want to be bothered with an ever-expanding continuity. And now that the anime is being produced by an entirely different studio, who knows? Oh my god, wait, Go Rush and Yu-Gi-Oh! Sevens? I watched the first few episodes of Sevens and I was like, it's not bad, it's okay. Okay, Rights to what characters are jumbled up where. But I like to believe that there was one die-hard fan of the show on the staff who was like, No! I will make sure there's one interconnected continuity! Or is that just me? WHY AREN'T YOU PAYING ME FOR THIS, KONAMI?! True! That Pay this man! Like, the, you'll have lawmasters for every single franchise now! Hire this man as a lawmaster! Make it all make sense! It's a connected timeline for the dual monsters through ARC-5 animes. But to include Brains, Sevens, Go Rush, and the various manga projects, we're going to have to move from a mildly compelling game of Connect the Dots okay. to some leap of logic speculation. Let's go! The playmaker in the Link Brain simulation is a weird one to fit into the series chronology. And after more research on the subject than I care to admit, I found one small detail. A tiny clue, one crumb of information that has me absolutely convinced that it does. Okay. The real trap card! What is Dimensional it? Dimensional barrier! Is that it? All right. Right? Let me explain. Dimensional barrier is a trap card. Oh my God, wait, it's actually the card? I thought that was like a lead up to the reveal. Is this, this is, it. oh, okay. It's released in the ARC-5 era booster pack, Invasion Vengeance. Its effect allows the user to declare a type of monster and negate the summoning and effects of that type of monster for the rest of the turn. Most importantly, the allowable monster types are Fusion, Synchro, Exceeds, Pendulum, and Ritual, implying that Ritual energy was mostly isolated to one little dimension of its own alongside the rest of the summoning powers. Okay. Even if we accept this card that's never appeared in the anime at face value, <laughs> how do we get from a ritual dimension exists? Okay, we're, we're going into the real goofy stuff now. We're going into the MatPat level of theory now. Let's go. To playmakers playing in the ritual dimension. Well, to start, their simple process of elimination. Brains just doesn't seem to fit with any of the dimensions established in Arc 5, with the technology seen throughout the show appearing to be both more sophisticated in some areas, but less in others. Suggesting that in that just seems like it's the normal progression of humanity. There's so many places on the planet that are really like stricken by poverty or they have really, really old tech. If you go to some places in Japan, they still use fax machines. But if you go to other places, they have capsule hotels and they have super technology. They have actual massive mecha robots. So it's just like normal Earth, right? Real development occurred on a completely separate track from those worlds seen previously. Even the game of Duel Monsters has regressed. In the first five series, duelists wishing to perform Fusion, Synchro, and Xyz summoning were able to do so relatively uninhibited, so long as they had the necessary cards to pull it off. But Vrains introduced some pretty specific limitations on advanced summoning, namely that players couldn't summon more than one Fusion, Synchro, or Xyz monster without the aid of newly introduced Link monsters. Could you imagine that there was riots in the Yu-Gi-Oh world when that was introduced? I don't know if it was genuinely in there from the beginning in this dimension, or if it was a change that was made to the game afterwards, but there would have been protests, there would have been riots, only one fusion summoned? What are you kidding me? This would have been a big change. This would be a political upheaval to which the world's never seen. Coups would be launched on behalf of this change to dual monsters in this world. Why? Well, it makes sense when you consider this in terms of energy. In Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds, we learn that dueling energy, or NRD as they call it in the dub, is a measurable phenomenon, something which Arc 5 reaffirms when the Leo Corporation begins covertly tracking duelists by monitoring the power output their cards generate when played. And while duelists are able to perform each summoning method in any dimension, it is suggested that each type of energy is limited outside of its home dimension. The okay. fusion energy, and therefore the ability to fusion summon, probably has some limits outside of the fusion dimension. Ditto for Synchro and Xyz. Okay. Enter Link Monsters. Oh, and since this is a completely different dimension, they would all have less power, and therefore they have less spaces on the board. I like that we're using actual in-game universal information to justify this dumb new rule they had to the game. Playmaker and the other Link Brains duelists frequently refer to the process of Link summoning as the closing of a circuit, which is important because of how they facilitate the use of extra deck monsters. An electrical circuit is simply an interconnection network that creates a path for an electrical current. Or, put simply, 
a circuit conducts energy from point A to point B. While there might be a deficit of fusion, synchro, and exceeds energy in the network of link brains, dualists can pass more readily available power through their link monsters and onto their other advanced monsters. But what's the one advanced monster type that doesn't require a link monster to come onto the main monster field? Pendulum? Ritual monster. Rituals. <laughs> there is no restriction on ritual summoning, and Vrains represented something of a ritual renaissance for the franchise. Which is cool because ritual monsters always seemed like a really cool idea, but there was only like Relinquish that was good and nothing else mattered. Like you'd have the Magician of Black Chaos, but it kind of sucked, it wasn't really that good. And all the other ones were just fine. What, you were gonna use Hamburglar? You're gonna use the Hamburger one? Uh, no, you're not gonna use the hamburger one. They all kind of sucked. The, the, the whale, the big crab. It was an interesting idea because you really needed these specific cards to be able to summon these monsters, but it was never worth it. You'd be going down like three cards just to summon something that has like 2,000 attack with no effect. It's completely pointless. The show features several instances of ritual summoning, the most of any series since the original Duel Monsters. 33 of the 114 ritual monsters in the game, or just under 30%, were released during the show's first run in Japan. And the Link Monster card art looks kind of like Ritual Summoning's Edgelord younger brother, which kind of makes sense. Same color. After all, what is a Link Monster? It's a computer program. We see Playmaker assemble them by manipulating data storms throughout the series, and his series of Talker Ace Monsters are all based on programming protocols. But what is a program? It's a repeatable series of processes that perform a specific task. And what's a ritual? Archaeologically speaking, it's a series of processes that perform a specific task. Oh my God. Sacrifice 99 villagers and you get seven millennium items. Oh my God. <laughs> night and you get a black luster soldier. Compile four sub programs and you get a firewall dragon. Intelligent enough machines can do- I can't believe it. Rituals are just the programming of the past. Except rituals don't actually work. Actually replicate ritualistic behavior. And suddenly, Link Vrains has the ability to source out additional power for the anemic summoning methods. So if you are a programmer, you may be unintentionally doing Satanism. Of Link monsters, the show's first season doesn't feature any advanced summoning mechanics other than Link summoning. But right off the bat in episode two of season two, Playmaker performs the show's first non-Link special summoning. A ritual. And who does he call forth? The Dark Magician-inspired ritual monster, Cyburst Magician. A few episodes later, we meet Soulburner's Salaman Great Emerald Eagle before seeing Cyburst Magician again. This means ritual monsters beat fusion, synchro, and exceeds monsters to the screen not one, not two, but three times in this particular series. But there is a hole in our theory. The other four dimensions- There's a white hole card? Wait, there's a white hole card? Series. Wait, what does it do? When your opponent activates dark hole, monsters you control cannot be- What a pointless card! What? That is the worst thing I've ever seen in my life! Why would you ever use this? This is the worst thing that I have ever seen! Dark hole is not used by anyone! Never mind having a trap in your deck that you need to place the turn before someone uses Dark Hole so that you can use it at the correct time. That you may not even draw at the correct time. That you probably have to have three of just to even have a chance of being used correctly. All so that you can just protect some of your monsters from Dark Hole when so many monsters already are unaffected by spells, traps. Most cards that you'd have in your deck have some kind of protection against spells already. What the fuck did they make this for? What a terrible ass card. Hole in our theory. The other four dimensions each resemble a specific period in history, a period where their preferred summoning method was at its height, meaning that a ritual dimension should theoretically exist when ritual summoning was at its peak. But when was ritual summoning at its height? Well, we don't really know, but we see the most instances of ritual summoning during the Duel Monsters era of the show, particularly during the Duelist Kingdom and pre-Battle City arcs, suggesting that a ritual dimension would likely be centered around this period, similar to the world we saw in the original anime, but different. And wouldn't you know- It also makes sense that the ritual dimension is in the original dimension because rituals are based off of old timey practices from thousands and hundreds of years ago where the entire point of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series is to relate back to the ancient times from ancient Egypt where rituals may actually have been used. So that makes sense too. No, we've already seen a world that's similar to the original anime, but different. In the film Dark Side of Dimensions, we see Kaiba unveil a new boss monster, the ritual-based Blue Eyes Chaos Max Dragon. This card is sick. I've actually used this card in real life in Jewels. I love it. It is so Moreover, cool. The film's antagonist, Aigami, introduces a brand new, never-before-seen summoning method, 
the curiously named dimension summoning method. But the most important thing to take note of in this film are the new dual discs that Kaiba unveils during the movie. Blue hologram projectors that store card data as software so that duelists no longer require physical cards to play the game. These dual discs are functionally identical to the ones seen across Link brains. Soul Technologies is widely distributing the technology that Seto Kaiba invented, implying that Vrains takes place after Darkseid. They exist on a single timeline, a timeline when this portion of history split off and became the Ritual Dimension, and where history played out differently from what we saw in the original series. Okay. Sure, things are similar. There's a Yugi and a Kaiba who were rivals and who saved the world. But this Yugi and this Kaiba are not the same as this Yugi and this Kaiba. Okay. They're actually the same as this Yugi and Kaiba. The manga versions. All right. Yu-Gi-Oh creator Kazuki Takahashi. Rest in peace, the GOAT. Moment to just respect the fact that the GOAT lost his life saving other people from drowning. R.I.P. Who served as the film's sole credited screenwriter has definitively stated that the movie serves as a sequel to his original manga and not the animated series produced by Studio Gala. Oh, okay. And only fans. This is why Kaiba seems to have forgotten being present for the ceremonial duel between Yugi and Atem. In the manga, he wasn't there. Kaiba disappeared after the Battle City arc and remained absent until the Dark Side prequel special, Transcend Game. Kaiba disappeared after Battle C? So he's not in any of the arcs after that? What? He's not in the dragon thing. He's not in the, the there's no Noah virtual reality thing. There's no final Battle C arc, what? And that, fellow duelists, brings us to the crux of this theory. Today, I propose that the Ritual Dimension is no more than the Yu-Gi-Oh! manga timeline. There was only Egypt after the battle city in the manga? What? So everything is filler? No! Then you're gonna tell me the Duke Devlin thing was filler as well. Pfft, there's no way. A version of history that was created after the rise of the Supreme King Zark and the fall of the original Dimension. As the Dimension set in the earliest period in history, and with no Zark fragments running around to fundamentally alter the course of events, this timeline would have continued on, moving into a GX era, then a 5Ds. What happens in the GX era then? Also, is that supposed to be Elemental Hero Neos that he's got on the, the start there? Because that doesn't, that's not, that's what Neos looks like. Oh, this is so different. Do I need to read the manga? Then on to his Exel, before reaching a new version of the Arc 5 period, where Zark never rose it's entirely power, different allowing what? history to move on to the era of link brains and this theory is given weight by the fact that Yu-Gi-Oh! brains is the first and only Yu-Gi-Oh! series not to feature a companion manga with the print version skipping it entirely because brains is the manga in favor of publishing an adaptation of Yu-Gi-Oh! sevens instead but why would we need a manga if this is in reality the story of the manga. Well, okay, let's be honest, the, the animes exist so they can translate the story of the manga most of the time. I had no idea that GX was completely different. I had no idea that 5Ds was completely different. I need to have a look at, I need a whole last video just to see what happened in GX and 5Ds then. And, and the original series, like what's different? Oh my God, I need, I need to check out all of this stuff now. There's, there's so much that's opened up to me. But for those of you who are familiar with the manga versions of these stories, you might well be asking yourself, why the stories presented in print are so different from the ones seen on screen. Yeah, After why? All, the GX manga also tells the story of Jade and Yuki's first year at Duel Academy, but rather than facing off against the Shadow Riders and the Sacred Beasts, Jaden is forced to contend with the dual spirit Tragadia, a creature whose Kaw was created from a survivor of the massacre that created the Millennium Items. Oh my god. 5D's manga doesn't feature Zone's apocalyptic future or time travel elements, but instead sees Yusei Fudo face off against the Goodwin brothers to prevent the Festival of Destiny, an what? ancient ritual used to resurrect the ultimate god. What? And Arc 5 is a time travel story that sees hero from the future, Yuya Sakaki, come back in time to seduce his own grandmother. What? Yeah, not making that up. Oh, it's like that Future Armor episode. You're your own grandpa. But why? Why are the stories and narratives in the ritual dimension so different from the ones seen in the original dimension? Well, it all comes down to one small change for one character, Kaiba. Kaiba? Seto Kaiba was present for the ceremonial duel between Yugi and the Pharaoh. He witnessed the Pharaoh bring out all three Egyptian god cards, the power that Kaiba himself had sought, and the Pharaoh still lost to Yugi. 
Kaiba's rivalry with the Pharaoh was put to rest. Yeah, because the Egyptian card cards aren't actually that good. And having to sacrifice three monsters on your field just to bring out one card that isn't even protected for the most part from like spells and traps and stuff. And they have like very basic protection. It's like not that good, you know, so you just like trap hole it probably. Because he saw for himself that Yugi was the true king of games. But in the ritual dimension, that never happened. Kaiba wasn't present for the final duel of the story. He didn't set foot into the Pharaoh's tomb until the events of Darkseid. That is true. The anime effects are actually different from the in-game effects, but the anime effects are just like nonsense that you make up. I swear to God, everyone just makes up the effects. Marek, when he was playing the Winged Dragon of Ra, it was like, now I'll summon the Winged Dragon of Ra. And with its special effect, I'll become the Winged Dragon of Ra. And then I'll, I'll, I'll be, I beat everyone and I can't be destroyed by any monsters. And I'm also protected from anything. And if I die, then I come back again. And I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to pay taxes anymore. They just make that up. His rivalry with the Pharaoh was never given closure. And so he began to obsessively search for a way to bring Atem back from the land of the dead where his anime counterpart moved on with his life and began projects in space exploration and renewable energy, the manga Kaiba- He became like a competent version of Elon Musk. ...dedicated himself to getting his final rematch with his lost rival. And at the end of Dark Side of Dimensions, we see him hurl himself into the land of the dead. To me, this- Least obsessive friend or stalker. <laughs> I think Kaiba- is in love with Atem, and he just wants to give him kiss. He's like, please, Yugi, I need you to kiss me on the lips, Yugi, please. I came back in time so I could taste those sweet cheeks, Yugi. This scene always read as though Kaiba knew that this would be a one-way trip. When his little brother worried that he might not come back, Kaiba evaded the subject and left everything in Mokuba's hands. When he reaches the afterlife, Damn, he said, sorry, bro. I know that we're family and I love you and all, but I'm gonna go die in the Egyptian ages because I really want to kiss Yugi. His body began to dissolve as he abandoned his crashed dimension ship. Seto Kaiba was willing to die if it meant proving to himself that he really was the best of the best and his death would have changed everything we know about the story of Yu-Gi-Oh after Duel Monsters. Oh my God, could you imagine if he goes back in time and still fucking loses? <laughs> Atem stands up, he's like, all right, fine. And he fucking beats him, and then he just dissolves. He's like, no! He orchestrated the events of the GX and 5Ds animes, Seto Kaiba. He founded the Duel Academy to study the mysteries surrounding the game of Duel Monsters, and had a direct hand in multiple aspects of the Light of Destruction and Dark Dimension storylines. The Kaiba Corporation was responsible for momentum, the destruction of Domino City, and the construction of New Domino City. But what if Kaiba had never been there? Would any of those stories have taken place? Probably not. Adventurers like Jaden Yuki and Yusei Fudo would still have been drawn to greatness, going out and forging their own stories regardless of the circumstances around them. But without Kaiba there to kick off the events that shaped their lives, the journeys they found themselves on would have been entirely different. Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel, a story where Kaiba's influence is much less pronounced, is coincidentally the only manga adaptation that retains the same core plot as its anime counterpart. And of course, the events of Arc 5 would have been completely different, as this is a dimension where Zark was never born, meaning that the Yuya, Yuto, Yugo, and Yuri seen within the events of the Arc 5 manga would be natural-born humans, free from the corruption of Zark's influence, and born as brothers within a single dimension, because the ritual dimension never repeated the events that caused the original dimension to divide in the first place. In many ways, this world is what the original dimension should have been. A single, unbroken universe that carries on where its predecessor failed. But oh, what about wow. Yu-Gi-Oh! Okay. Go Rush, you might be asking. Well, from the first episode of Seven, Kid show. I think it's pretty obvious that this show takes place after Vrains. In the premiere episode, protagonist Yuga Odo creates the new Rush Duel format as he felt that the game had become too structured and restricted. That's so funny. That's literally what we used to do in the school when we were kids. Whenever there was something that you didn't like about the actual rules, you would just be like, uh, well, I, I don't want to use the rules. I swear, when I was playing Yu-Gi-Oh! on the schoolyard with my friends, people wouldn't tribute. People would use like spells in the monster zone. They would put cards like face down attack mode. They just made his own version of the game, which is exactly what kids do, which is really cool. I like that. Hearing the sentiments that fans all over the world had about the master rules format implemented during the Vrains era of the game. 
After Yuga accidentally forced the world to adopt the Rush Duel format, the Link Frame simulation would have been incompatible and fallen out of prevalence. Then comes Yu-Gi-Oh! Go Rush, which is- okay, I've never I've never even heard of Go Rush until now. It's a direct sequel to Sevens. Main characters Yui and Yuamu Oga are related to Yuga, and the world is still utilizing Yuga's Rush Duel format. And where the franchise goes from here? I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see what comes with time. This is a fantastic video. You did evolve, you did upload this in uh, 2022. So hopefully you're still going because this was so well made. It was really awesome. Oh, you uploaded six months ago. I mean, this was an awesome video. I, I really enjoyed this a lot. Uh, so Spell Commander, you did a really good job. I imagine you're not watching this, but if you are, I think you should keep making videos because you are really good at it. And uh, if you want me to react to any videos, let me know on my Discord server.